understand where we go from here, the status of the war, what can we expect, and how this has changed, or not, the global order. And for that, we have two amazing guests. Thank you for, for um, uh, saying yes to, to being here, helping us analyze this. Uh, we have Daniela F. Mello. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get my, my <laughs> notes here. She's a doctor of political science in the field of comparative politics and international relations, and currently a lecturer at the University of Boston. She's frequently asked to do political analysis for numerous media outlets and has also done some work as a consultant regarding uh, European politics. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you. Uh, and also joining us is political scientist Everett Vieira III, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at California State University, Fresno. And he specializes in comparative politics, international relations, and methodology. His teaching and research interests focus on terrorism, political violence, human rights, democratization, and Latin America. And Everett holds a PhD in political science from Temple University. Uh, I am going to moderate this discussion. I, my name is Ana Rita Guerra. I am a um, foreign correspondent for Portuguese news agency Lusa and other outlets. Um, and I am a member of the Foreign Press uh, Association. Ooh, who, you know, uh, organ uh, organizing this. So let's let's get started with. Um, here, here's what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna ask each of you to to start us off, to do a brief assessment of the the last year of the war uh, or the first year of the war. Um, and where do we stand right now? What what are your assessment? What is your assessment, Daniela? I was hoping you would start with Everett. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you so much for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be able to speak um, with both of you and whoever's watching us about this very important topic. Um, where are we at? Um, we're at a difficult juncture, uh, I would say, in this particular war. Um, I would say that the current trend um, is that it is not for the war to end anytime soon. Of course, trends can change, uh, but we can really only speak it in terms of trends. And right now, I would say that that trend is for us to be looking at more of a long-term conflict than, than the quick solution. Um, so here's what I see, right? Um, there's a Russian offensive. Um, there's the issue of potential shortage of ammunition in the supply of the Ukrainian front. And that's a problem that needs to be resolved within NATO and the allies. Um, if the Ukrainians are going to be able to break the stalemate uh, in the current offensive. What I also see is that Putin remains deeply entrenched in his position. And that's not a strong signal for any sort of ceasefire for any peace situation. The Russian economy has resisted collapse in spite of the sanctions. Um, it's not that it's not hurting. It, it is clearly hurting. Uh, it's just not hurting as much as some analysts thought it might be, um, in part because it has found ways around some of the sanctions as well. Um, in terms of the population and support for the war effort, it's very, very clear that the Ukrainian population remains supportive of the leadership and supportive of fighting. Um, and that's very telling in terms of, you know, willingness uh, and morale, right, of the troops to continue to fight. Uh, I see very little evidence of the Ukrainians losing heart anytime soon. Um, what I also see is that NATO continues to be unwilling to engage directly in the war, but willing to continue to support. And incrementally, <laughs> uh, it has gone from the, what some might label as timid support to very strong support um, of the Ukrainian war effort. And what I also see, which is unusual in foreign policy, um, is an alignment between the European elites, even the American elites, and the population on the question of Ukraine. 
meaning that it's rare that in foreign policy, <laughs> you have the leadership saying, we have to throw a lot of money at this problem. We have to, um, you know, pinch pennies and uh, we have to suffer a little in order to help a foreign country and a foreign nation. And what we've seen thus far, which again, I highlight, I think it's highly unusual in foreign policy, is the Europeans, um, or the vast majority of the European public remain supportive of helping this effort. And it's for all of these reasons and probably a number of other reasons that I can't think of the moment that I would say that right now, um, I don't see an exit ramp yet for this conflict. And we might be looking, I, I know that nobody wants to, to, to truly believe that and I don't either, but we might be looking at a conflict that could drag for one, two, three, four years. Wow. Um, okay. What about you, Everett? Um, what are some the key moments of this year? And um, Daniela was mentioning the continued support from the population. However, we have seen in the United States a little bit a decrease in the number of people who said yes, let's send weapons and 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 money to Ukraine. So, is that relevant, Everett? What do you think? I do think it's I do think it's relevant. Um, and I just want to acknowledge everything that Daniela said. I completely agree with. Um, a few other items, a few other details I want to acknowledge before I think we can talk about, you know, continued support or lack thereof. Um, we've seen international condemnation of the Russian Federation with this unprovoked war. We've seen war crimes. We have over eight million, this is just a couple of days ago from the UNHCR, over eight million refugees in uh, throughout Europe right now, another six million internally displaced persons. Uh, within Ukraine. Um, and <clears throat> I should note, or I should preface with a, a caveat, in political violence, um, most of the data, most of the figures that we have are going to severely undercount uh, casualties. They're going to severely undercount um, fatalities. So when we look at numbers like uh, 19,000 civilian casualties recorded, including over 7,000 deaths, that's a very conservative estimate. Those are acknowledged, uh, or, or rather, um, reported and verified, right? There's a t there is so much more damage, not including uh, you know infrastructure damage, uh, in particular to civilian uh, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, um, apartment complexes, et cetera, uh, energy sector. Right? Um, we we've seen a lot more damage than what has actually been uh, reported and verified. That being said, right? Uh, I think the, the first part of the question is like, what are some of the key moments of, of the war? Um, I truly believe the fact that Kiev is still in. Ukrainian hands, right, um, is a massive uh, moment in the war. I think uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia thought that this would be, you know, shock and awe to uh, borrow some language from 2003, the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Um, I think they thought it was going to be shock and awe. They'd win very quickly, uh, annex more of Ukrainian territory and just make it Russia. The fact that Ukraine has been able to withstand uh, the Russian invasion, I think, is a massive a uh, massive just general moment overall in the war. Um, and there's been a few that have caught headlines, right? We can think of, um, uh, I want to be careful how I say this, but like uh, those folks on Snake Island, the Ukrainians on Snake Island who said F you to the uh, Russian warships. Um, I think that is a very symbolic example of Ukrainian resistance. Um, the fact that the Ukrainians are entrenched um, and as Daniela mentioned, don't show any signs of giving up anytime soon. Um, we can think of, I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, oh gosh, what's the name of that organ of the the town? Um, essentially, uh, they're the heroes of it was Mariupol. Sorry, Mariupol, right? Um, the folks who uh, the, these these uh, soldiers who who bunkered down, I believe, like in a steel factory, uh, they held out for more than two months. That kind of resolve against you know a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council and the Russian Federation, a nuclear superpower. I think these are symbolic moments in the war. As far as a lack of, uh, or maybe a waning um, uh, reinforcement or a waning support of, um, of Ukraine in this, in this war, I think there's some loud voices um, noting that, right? Uh, some loud folks who are in opposition, in particular here in the United States, right? In our US Congress, who are pushing back against the uh, supporting Ukraine. But President Biden just made uh, uh, an appearance in Ukraine, not just right, not just in uh, Eastern Europe, but in Ukraine itself. Um, uh, England uh, or the United Kingdom, uh, Germany, the United States, and other European uh, uh, states sending um, tanks, right, 
sending um, uh, actual legitimate um, armaments to support the Ukrainians, I think is maybe more indicative of, and again, I want to echo what Danielle, Daniela said, more indicative of a long lasting war. This doesn't seem to, uh, or doesn't appear to be over anytime soon. So yeah, I'm sure that there's always going to be detractors for any policy, uh, regardless if it's domestic or international, security, economic, what, what have you. Um, but it, it almost looks like a stalemate at, at the moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Granted, uh, a lot of a lot of destruction, a lot of horrible, horrible atrocities. But I would say, um, yes, those are important voices, these detractors, but I don't see it uh, stopping anytime soon. And, and did you think that the visit, the surprise visit that President Biden uh, did, appearing with, with Zelensky in, in, a, in a show of support, was that very important for the next phase of the war? I think so. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, the midterms here domestically, right, just ended a few months ago. Uh, Republicans have taken back uh, the House. Um, obviously, we'll need uh, congressional support, uh, right, or approval, rather, to continue our, our support, whether it's money or armaments to the Ukrainians. But when the executive of the United States, right, when the commander in chief of the U.S. military goes to Ukraine and stands with Zelensky and says, our, our aid will continue into the future, th that means something, right? Um, what that looks like, what that aid will look like, I, I, I don't know. I'm not in the DOD, right? But uh, aid will continue. Right. Okay. So then, the, the next question that I want to ask is, um, how 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 did the war change the geopolitical balance? We are we entering a new global order, or or not yet? What do you, what do you think, Daniela? That's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> Everyone understands, I think, in, in, in the field of foreign policy analysis, that there's a shift, right? Um, that there's a shift in the balance of power at the international level, that there are new players um, like China. And, and Russia is not one of the superpower players. In fact, one of the, one of the explanations as to this overreaction by Russia has to do with sort of trying to regain the superpower status uh, that it sees slipping, slipping away. Um, but, you know, the United States has been preparing for a contention with China, I would say, for many years. In fact, this is a discussion that was happening even in the 1980s, but I think more vocally by the late 1990s as the Clinton administration was living and the Bush administration is coming in. I remember the Bush administration in particular being very clear about um, the rise of China and our competition with China and why if we wanted to keep our status and if we wanted to keep the liberal international order functioning um, in, in the same manner that we needed to pay attention to that. Of course, that administration then got derailed by 9-11. Uh, I should say distracted, not uh, derailed may not be the right term, but um, you know, of course they became focused in, in a new type of threat. Um, and the, the question of China went back to the back burner until the Obama administration, right? But why am I saying this? Obviously China is going to be a key player here. Obviously China, um, has a different understanding of what it wants this international order to look like, and it has been challenging it quite, quite actively. Um, so what will the new international order look like? That's very difficult <laughs> to respond. Um, I certainly don't think that we are quite yet entering a new Cold War. For many reasons, this is a very different situation from the situation in 1945. We are, you know, China is a nuclear power. We're, we don't have any clear strategic advantage to rebuild a new international order as we did back in 1945. By we, I mean the West and the United States. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to tell, but what you can do is, is look at the trends, right? Uh, sort of with the war, as I was saying, you can look at the fracture lines in, at a global level in who is supporting the West and who is not. Um, and in many ways, this conflict with Ukraine is sort of a litmus test for that, where those fracture lines are, right? So we are seeing uh, China trying to have their cake and eat it too, <laughs> in terms of how they are playing their neutrality in this conflict. At some point, I predict China is going to have to take a more assertive stance um, one way or the other. But in the meantime, what we are seeing 
is countries like India and China continuing to buy Russia's oil and continuing to support Russia economically, um, not militarily yet. But we are also seeing sort of a new dizzying up of the developing world in terms of alliances, right? And I think this is playing out very visibly in, in, in Africa in particular, right? In which we, we're seeing countries like South Africa uh, doing naval exercises with the Russians in the Indian Ocean. I mean, those are very, very strong signals of realignment, right, in the global order. Hmm. Everett, what do you think, what do you make of the role of China here? Um, Daniela was mentioning um, how China has been looked at as the biggest threat in the United States. Um, and now they, they're, they're kind of towing the line. You, you can't really understand where they're falling. What do you think? 100% agree. Uh, China has to straddle, right? Uh, backing Russia, not backing Russia, um, acknowledging uh, an illegal war versus, uh, you know, respecting sovereignty. Uh, China has to has to maintain some sort of peace with Russia, right? Um, but also, China doesn't want to be at the uh, well, doesn't want to be the target of U.S. sanctions, right? Directly, unilaterally. So, um, and and uh, in addition to like the global South, right? Like kind of. Uh, supporting or, or at least like welcoming uh, Russia, right? In particular in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. China's also making inroads in these same areas as well. So um, I completely agree with Daniela. We don't, I don't think we're in a new Cold War. Um, has this reshaped uh, the global political order? I don't think so, at least not yet. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention, right? Institutions matter, but power matters, I would argue even more. For example, just yesterday, uh, 140 uh, different states in the United Nations condemned, uh, right on the on the eve of the anniversary of this war, um, condemned this war. Uh, but Russia, China, the United States, France, the United Kingdom all have veto votes on the UN Security Council. So while there might be uh, wide scale uh, international support, if China wants to engage with Russia or the United States, although I would imagine probably be the former rather than the latter, they can do so, right? If Russia wants to invade Ukraine, obviously they did, and and they uh, will continue to do so. Um, I do think, however, uh, and I'm glad Daniela mentioned like a litmus test. I, I also think that this invasion and the West response um, is a is a I hate to say it this way, but almost an experiment, like a lab experiment for China to see, okay, how does the West respond to a war of aggression? How would the West respond to our China's invasion of Taiwan. Um, how fast can the West mobilize, right, in, uh, in support of a smaller democracy uh, to see how fast and or how slow, depending on your perspective, the United States and their allies have got, come to the aid um, of Ukraine might be indicative of how fast the United States and their allies might come to, a, to the aid of Taiwan in the future, should China uh, decide to invade. Hmm. That, that's interesting because if if the West is already dealing with Russia's aggression in Ukraine, will they have the same a strong uh, position if if China does something? Can can they actually do they have the resources, the allies, to do the same? Probably not. Or or maybe forget? maybe not. But then you also have to think about like domestic concerns, right? Uh, we just ended twenty years in in Afghanistan. Now we're marking the one year anniversary in Ukraine. What's next? Something way off in Taiwan when inflation's high and uh, interest rates are high here. Like we've had, and by the way, and I read, we've had this conversation many times in, in interviews we've done over the past few months. There's domestic concerns and there's international concerns. So will the United States government, regardless of who's in the White House, right, who's in charge in Congress, will they have domestic support to continue to aid these other states, these smaller states mm. who are our allies, right, who are, um, you know, uh, even even fledgling, uh, but still democracies, right? And so do we just allow wars of aggression to go unchecked? I, I think that's a million dollar question that I I don't know. I'm not in power. I can't really answer that question of whether or not support will continue or, or there'll be a, a steadfast commitment to these to these allies. But I do think that this is an, not nice, but I think this is a, a, a an interesting example of how 
uh, the West might respond to uh, Chinese aggression in, in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, can, I, can I add something to that? <laughs> yes, yeah. let, me, let, me just, let me just tell people who are watching, if you would like to ask some questions, we have a few minutes in, at the end. So just uh, hit the Q&A button and send us our questions and I will get to them at the end. Go ahead, Professor. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to to build on what Everett was saying to, you know, I'm not a Chinese expert and I will not purport to be a Chinese expert. So <laughs> um, with that caveat, what I do see China doing is also a sort of triangulation, which is fascinating to me because, you know, if you're into for U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy history, you know that diplomatic triangulation was a key strategy of the Nixon-Kissinger strategy <laughs> to bring China into the game, into, into the fore again in international politics, and that they used talks with China in order to leverage, right, what they wanted, their interests with the USSR at the time. And I think that China is now doing it to us. Right. I think that China is engaging in some triangular diplomacy and it's trying to use this to like it's basically engaging the USS, the USSR, Russia, sorry, now Russia. It is engaging Russia in a way to gain leverage on the United States in the areas of conflict that it has with the United States. Um, so I do think that there's. Um, that, that China is using the rift between the United States and Russia to gain leverage on its own issues, right? And on its own security issues um, in the, in the Indo-Pacific, in the South China Sea, in the balance of power of that entire region. Mm. Uh, uh, you, uh, Professor Everett, you, you were mentioning the, the, the support uh, the, the Western allies uh, have been uh, giving uh, Ukraine. And, and I don't know which, which of you uh, mentioned the influx of refugees, which in the past has been a very, very sensitive topic in Europe, uh, but it does not seem to be having the same effect right now. So this influx of refugees, do you predict that it, things might change in the future um, if, if worsening economic conditions uh, start pitting uh, European uh, countries one against the other, uh, fight for resources or not? Or, or, or do you think that the, European the Ukrainian refugees are being received at a different uh, how how can I put this lightly? Are being received differently than than refugees in the past from, say, Syria? Thank you for for asking that question, Anna Rita. Yeah, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this isn't well tragic. And we're marking the one year anniversary of of I would argue it an illegal war. This isn't the only conflict going on in the world. Um, there are conflicts that are several are several years older. Um, you mentioned Syria. We could look at uh, Ethiopia, Yemen, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Afghanistan, El Salvador, other locations in the world um, that maybe don't have uh, large Christian populations or don't have large populations that identify as white. So the uh, idea of uh, say, uh, Muslims or uh, individuals from the Arab from Arab countries not assimilating into German culture, not assimilating to Austrian or Poland or Polish culture, excuse me. Um, there's a there's an eye test. You can see that someone looks different, that they dress different, right? They have a different skin color um, versus perhaps individuals from Ukraine who are coming over who may look similar to the Polish or the Austrians or the Germans, et cetera. So I do think that there is some level of ethnocentricity, uh, perhaps even racism, um, on the fact that a lot of these refugees are being welcomed. Um, yes, of course, it's going to be pushed back. There will always be pushback from conservatives um, and, and every, and every, uh, and every state, but it's not the same kind of hostility uh, aimed at these individuals as there have been from Syrian refugees, Tunisian refugees, Yemeni refugees. Um, and, and I, maybe I forgot the rest of the, the question. But well, that, I was I was asking if if with the worsening economic con conditions, mm -hmm. can that start to change in the future? I know I know we're we're playing this game of predictions, and it's hard. But w what is your feel? Could right it now? could it change? Of course, absolutely. Right at the end of the day, um, if you're competing 
for work with, you know, over a million refugees in Germany or over a million refugees in Poland, right? Um, you need to feed your family and you're angry, you're upset that you can't get a job or you can't feed your family, you can't pay the rent because of this influx of, of foreigners. Of course, there's going to be pushback. Of course, there's going to be um, resentment. Um, will your state be paying to house these individuals or help resettle these individuals when they could really, could you know, using those same funds um, and reallocating them toward your education system or your healthcare system or infrastructure, right? Roads and bridges and whatnot. Absolutely, that could, could lead to resentment. Um, hmm. Will it though? I mean, you're right. We're playing a prediction game. I, I can't tell you, uh, um, as Daniela said, I'm not a Chinese expert. I'm also not a uh, Eastern European uh, expert as well. But, you know, <laughs> could that happen? Of course, absolutely. Will it happen? I I don't know. I think we have to see how the uh, how the economic uh, situation unfolds. And so if if we're expecting a, a prolonged war, uh, is that benefiting Russia, Daniela, do you think? Um, because uh, as as the, the 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 time goes by and people get tired of the situation and all the price that they have to pay at the gas pump, at the, you know, their energy bill, uh, high inflation, the influx of refugees, uh, will that benefit Russia as they destroy Ukraine? So Ukraine might not lose the war, but maybe become uh invite inviable uh as a country so will it benefit russia that's a big question um i I'm, i want to build on a couple of things that everett said i think that this intersects with a couple of things uh economic conditions worsening is always bad for stability <laughs> of a policy uh of a foreign policy like this right uh worsening economic conditions often put a lot of pressure on leadership to change track, uh, whatever that track is. I do think that this is a special situation for the Europeans, though. Um, the Europeans look at this war. I mean, some of the things that Everett said is right. You know, there's certainly, uh, I, I don't want to dismiss the, the ethnic and racial aspect of solidarity, which is and cultural aspect of solidarity, which seems to be present. But I would add to that, that most Europeans do understand that this is also existential for them. Um, it's 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 a war next door, right? And I, you know, from the psychology <laughs> of public opinion, I would I would predict that you would only have a major shift. It suddenly Russia gains some major advantage, and it looks like this is a lost cause for the Ukrainians. Um, I think in a situation like that, that you might have more of a push um, from public opinion to to shift direction, to may maybe withdraw, to uh, obviously the Europeans understand that this war could spill over very quickly. And again, when I say the Europeans, I don't mean just the leadership. I, the population feels that. The population understands that, the potential for spillover. So it's more than that. It's, it's, it's an existential threat. And because they understand this as an existential threat, <laughs> um, I think it is less likely that um, even an economic downturn will be the major determinant of how the population and the elites feel about support for the Ukraine here. Um, but your question had another part that I'm now forgetting. Yes, yeah, so if it benefits <laughs> Russia, if it benefits Russia, that this becomes a protracted, like a, a very prolonged. Conflict. I don't think so. I don't think so. So let me give you an example that comes to mind, or two examples, right? Saddam Hussein deciding to invade Iran in 1980, <laughs> right? Saddam Hussein decides to invade Iran in the middle of the Iranian revolution and claims to the world that, you know, this is going to be a few days, right? He is going to gain this geopolitical and economic advantage. He's going to gain territory. He's going to uh, take over entire areas that uh, are rich in oil. I mean, he only sees a win-win-win situation with it gross miscalculation, right? And it's a gross miscalculation uh, akin to the gross miscalculation that Mr. Putin did in evaluating the determination of the Ukrainians and the determination of the Europeans to see this as existential on their side as well. Another, you know, uh, you know what, what happened with Iran, just to finish that, that parallel, what happened with, Iran, with the Iran-Iraq war? We ended up having a protracted conflict that lasted eight years, if memory doesn't. And at the end of that war, where were we? Where was Iraq and where were Iran? Status quo antebellum, 
right? It went back to the status quo before the war in terms of borders, and we had a more consolidated regime in Iran, and we had a weaker regime in Iraq. And I actually think that that parallel um, might play out in Russia, right? Uh, I mean, there's many, many other factors, but I don't think Russia truly benefits from um, from a protected conflict that is, again, likely to return to the status quo of the borders before at the end when it comes to the negotiation table. Another example, and I don't I don't want to dominate too long here. So if I'm talking too long, you know, cut me off. Um, but, you know, Vietnam, Vietnam is an obvious example, right? Even if the Europeans removed, even if NATO removed its support for Ukraine, I'm not convinced at all that the conflict would end. Right. I mean, even if they're defeated on the battleground, what I see here is a Ho Chi Minh you know, fighting for uh, national liberation and and the Viet Minh who will fight to the last man um, to maintain, you know, to 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 avenge right, the attack uh, on Ukraine and to fight for uh, this national identity, which has become so, so entrenched and so much more marked during the conflict. So, you know, if this war shifts from being a traditional war into being an asymmetric war, we will still have war. And I don't think that benefits I mean, if we look at historical conflicts that look like this type of war of attrition in the re in the recent decades, I think what they teach us is that, you know, Russia is at a disadvantage and is unlikely to win a war in which the other side is deeply committed and has so much heart in the fight. Mm. But but as Everett was, was mentioning, uh, there's been massive destruction of Ukraine. So the question there is, uh, even if Ukraine is not defeated, uh, can it still be viable as a country at the end of this? What do you it think? Can. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Daniela, if if you want, if you want to go ahead. No, no, Everett, please take it. <laughs> well, I don't. Let me just start by saying I don't disagree with Daniela. Um, as we've seen, right, uh, asymmetric war oftentimes will favor the home the home team, right? Who know the land better, who know the territory better, particularly like in urban urban warfare, um, who have much more um, intrinsic value, right, in in fighting until the very end. Um, that being said, tactically, and to play devil's advocate, the war means more to Russia and Ukraine than it does to the Western allies. So, Russia is a massive state, right? It's the largest state by land mass on on Earth. Um, it has a lot of resources. It can potentially wait out the West. And on one hand, right, you could say anything short, anything short of an absolute destruction uh, and capitulation of the Ukrainians um, uh, or of Ukraine to, to Russia would be seen as a loss for, for Russia. But at the same time, Putin's the master of, of spin, right? He can go in and say, you know what, we've taken, uh, I think uh, I could have the, the math off right now, but it's 10, 11% of Ukrainian uh, territory they control right now. They can uh, reinforce their their um, their presence in the Donbas region. Uh, they've already annexed Crimea some uh, eight nine years ago, right? Then they could utilize right time, um, uh, resources, etc., to then negotiate a peace settlement and say, okay, well, we've annexed these new places or these new territories. We've expanded Russia's reach, right? We're moving back toward. Um, you know, Soviet power, um, the, the, the 1980s, right, uh, uh, thought process or, or um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, just like belief in, in absolute Soviet power. And that could be seen as a win, right? So does this look bad for Russia? Yes, of course, right? Uh, Putin sending 300,000 more troops, right, to the front lines. That's kind of pathetic, honestly, from like a, just like a power perspective. But does he have to win everything, right? Does he have to take over the entire country? Of course, that's what he would like. But is it necessary? I don't. I don't think it's necessary for a, a, a win. Um, but to your point or to your question, Anna Rita, about um, even if Ukraine does win, right? Even if they do repel the the Russians, are they still viable? I mean, security is the number one thing that a state needs, right, to be viable. Because if you don't have security, you can't. You can't build roads because people have, you know, uh, improvised explosive devices. Look at Iraq, right? Uh, if you don't have security, how do you protect your hospitals and your schools and your civilian apartment buildings, which is which are being targeted right now, right? 
um, by the Russians. So can they be viable? Yes. Is it likely? I, I find that really hard to believe that it would be likely that they would continue to be viable after so much destruction. And if 10% ish, let's just call it a ballpark number of territory has been taken over control by the Russians in one year. If we were just to double this in a year, assuming, right, we have the same sort of Russian offensives and that's 20%. This lasts for three years, that's 30%. So a third of Ukrainian territory could belong to Russia in three years. And at which point they can negotiate a ceasefire or, a, or a, mm. uh, an armistice of some kind. Uh, and that's just, you know, uh, that's just hedging, I suppose. But that that could also be uh, a potential result. Uh, let me just ask uh, one question before we get to the audience's questions. Um, do you think that uh, Putin's position uh, and the Kremlin's position uh, in, internally in, in Russia uh, will survive this? You said that he's a master spinner. Last year, there was some talk that maybe there would be an, an erosion of his power. Uh, but it seems like even the, the, the Russia population is behind him and the ones that are not just left. What do you think? Do, do you Daniela? want me to take that? Yeah, okay. go ahead, go ahead, take Sorry. it. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to know um, if there's significant elite fracturing <laughs> or not. Um, You're not going to tell us, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, they're not going to tell us. Um, I mean, there are some very telling signals and I, you know, Putin understands that better than anybody else, right? If you have an economic downturn and if your top elites turn against you, you're not likely to survive the job, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and, and Russia certainly has a long history of coups <laughs> and Putin is very well aware of that. Um, and, and, you know, even his speech this week needs to be understood in those terms, right? He, it's, it's not just, Spin, but it's 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 powerful spin to try to um, to try to cast this as an existential threat against Russia that only someone like him can take on, right, and help defend Russia from. Um, I would say that you know it's it's very interesting to see. Um, I, I was going to talk about Prigozhin and. Um, his statements a few days ago against the military leaders. So we have mercenaries fighting uh, a side by side the traditional military. Uh, there's clearly a lot of dissent between the two groups, a lot of competition between the two groups that cannot be making the high rankings, high ranking generals in the military very happy. Uh, with the situation, because they also have soldiers on the ground that uh, soldiers, mercenaries on the ground uh, who are using up uh, resources that would otherwise go to the military and who don't have to respond to the military and, in fact, don't seem to respond to many other people other than, you know, the leader. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of signals of fracturing. It's also really clear, you know, as much as um, we see criticism that the sanctions maybe have not been as effective as, as, as the hope was. You know, sanctions often take a long time to really reveal their effects. Um, they have slowed down dramatically uh, the Russian economy. They have led to major, you know, there's major inflation, much bigger than the inflation level that we are feeling in the West within Russia. Um, the economy is slowing down, jobs are, I mean, but that has been the strength of Putin. The strength of Putin was to come uh, in early 2000 and to say, hey, you are never going to have to live through a period like the 1990s ever again. You're never going to have to be in bread lines. Uh, you know, the trade-off for me to be <laughs> the leader of Russia is that I will give you a stable economy. I will give you jobs. You can feed your children, send them to school. And I take care of security and I take care of power projection. So he's definitely in danger. He's danger in danger within his own elites and he's in danger with his own population. But nobody, nobody can predict with with any certainty when that break will happen and if it will happen. There's just too many variables at work. Um, if I could switch just for a second, and, and I, I wanted to add something to the previous comments from Everett about mm -hmm. um, the resilience of Ukraine, if you think that's okay. Sure. Um, I just, you know, I agree with everything that Everett 
uh, highlighted, I would add that, you know, the survival and viability of the Ukrainian state, in my mind, depends on the support of the West. You know, um, the European Union obviously would be the like in in a world in which this war ends and Russia is defeated and or there's some sort of negotiation um, and it becomes clear that and I mean, Ukraine gets promised a path to the European Union, if not a path to NATO, um, then the European Union would be that anchor. Right. The European mm. Union would be the support to help rebuild. And with that backing up, I have no doubt that international investment would flock to a place like Ukraine um, to help rebuild the country. So I do think that there's a path for viability, um, even, even with the level of destruction that we're seeing. Okay, at least one optimistic note uh, today. Uh, let me let me get to the audience questions. Um, Ann Castor asks, Professor Vieira, do you think she has pivoted on Taiwan, watching the military might it takes, uh, especially over a body of water to invade, and watching the aid of the West? I mean, uh, from Ann Castor, that's a fantastic question. I alluded to this earlier. I'm not a Chinese expert, uh, mm -hmm. but I would say. Um, perhaps, perhaps she has, has pivoted, but something that Daniela mentioned earlier about like triangulating diplomacy, right? Xi doesn't need, doesn't have to invade Taiwan, but the threat of invading Taiwan could gain concessions, right? Um, the fact that he could send some warships into the Taiwan Strait without actually putting boots on the ground could heighten tensions. And how do you um, de-escalate, well, perhaps capitulate on economic terms or capitulate on human rights terms or capitulate on climate concerns. There could be a whole host of things. Um, one thing, uh, and Daniela mentioned earlier, I'm so glad she just, and I promise I'll bring it back to China, um, that Daniela <laughs> mentioned about Putin coming to power in 2000. I mean, the 1990s were absolutely horrible for Russia. I mean, this is a, this is a, you know, a former offshore balancer of the United States, a global hegemon, and they're going to declare bankruptcy. They're going hat in hand to the IMF and to the United States. Please, please, please help us because uh, uh, we're going to experience a famine. Um, mm -hmm. That was incredibly embarrassing for the Russians. So after Yeltsin resigns and leaves, this little guy, Vladimir Putin, comes in, becomes president, right? Interim, then wins an election in 2000. And, and I think this is, forgive me for going like all professorial on this point, but he wins back-to-back -back elections, four-year terms, right? There's That's part of the Russian constitution, but his hand-picked successor, Dmitry Medvedev, becomes president. And who does he select to be his prime minister? Oh, Putin. And then during that four-year period, they rewrite the constitution to allow six-year terms. And so does Dmitry Medvedev run for re-election? For some reason, no. Putin comes back in 2012, wins a six-year election. 2018 wins the second six-year election. So he can be president until 2024. And then just recently, they have once again amended the Russian constitution. So in theory, Vladimir yeah. Putin, if he desired, could be president for life. Coming back now to China, President Xi Jinping is technically president for life in China. He, The Chinese constitution is really just a vehicle for the CCP's uh, mandates, right? The Politburo of, of the Chinese Communist Party. So Xi thought, right? He's, you know, we've had other leaders in China like Hu Jintao and Deng Xiaoping, but Xi Jinping is the biggest name and the biggest presence in China since Mao. So does, does Xi need to, uh, I don't know, uh, do the exact same thing Putin has done in Ukraine uh, by invading Taiwan? Not necessarily. Um, he could just utilize threats. He could utilize um, bargaining chips, right, to get what he wants in other facets. Maybe it's uh, continuing to arm the South China Sea. Maybe it's further inroads in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or in Latin America, which is actually a region I focus on. There's been a ton of Chinese investments. Um, any, everything from Huawei's you know, 5G network system to uh, building roads, and bridges, uh, New Panama Canal, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, coming back to the, the, the question from Castor, um, has he pivoted? Maybe, uh, and I'll end with this, maybe, maybe not, but he's still going to use it to his advantage. I, I guarantee that he will still 100% utilize it to his advantage. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Tsipi Ben Haim. 
isn't it time to encourage peace talks? And who could, who could be the best negotiator to make this happen? Daniela, want to take that one? Uh, sure. It's, you know, it's always time to encourage peace talks. Um, but I think realistically, look, you know, peace, it takes two to tango, <laughs> right? In this case, it takes many more to tango for peace talks to be viable. Um, it's difficult to call for peace talks when you have the positioning of the aggressor in this situation be the one that President Putin stated this week. So um, there, you know, there seems to be no clear exit ramp for Putin out of this war. Um, it seems unclear, and he doesn't seem to have. Um, Let me put it like this. There doesn't seem to be any behind the curtains, uh, meaningful conversations between the United States and Russia on this or between other NATO members and Russia on this. So potential the, negotiators. Yeah, potential. Exactly. So in the but in the absence of that communication, right, everything is guesswork in terms of what Putin is going to do next. Uh, what might he do? Like it's reading of signals. Right. And reading of signals can go really well or it can go really badly. Um, I, I guess I'm saying this because I would say that there's nothing to offer on the table yet. There's uh, it's unclear what can actually bring put into the table. And he doesn't feel that he is in a position in which he needs to negotiate or and, and I mean negotiate, not just come and stipulate the terms right, of what the end to this conflict would be. So I hope that um, in three, four, six months, right, um, there's a different situation, but that will depend on how the Ukrainian troops perform on the ground against this offensive as well. I don't think that moment is right now, no matter how much we all wish to see this conflict over. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so Nancy Camel asks, how would formal acceptance to NATO and EU, less likely, but possible, uh, alter your prognosis? Everett, do you want to take that? Sure, I'll, I'll jump on that one. Um, so, uh, and, and maybe Daniela can correct me on this, um, but I'm 99% sure in order to uh, be eligible to join NATO and or the EU, your state cannot be at war. You cannot be engaged in a conflict. So all Putin has to do technically is keep firing missiles into Ukraine or sending waves of soldiers right into the Donbass or into Crimea. So at any point, right, that, that's like a, almost like a uh, like a veto move, if you will, right, uh, to prevent uh, Ukraine from joining the EU and, and or NATO. Um, flip side of that is look what happened with Finland and Sweden. This incursion, and Daniela mentioned this earlier, right? The existential uh, uh, threat to um, the rest of Europe, right? Not just European leaders, but European uh, civilians, right? Uh, the Finns have seen this, right? The Swedes have seen this. They're they're saying, fine, you you are forcing us. Although Putin has argued it's NATO's aggression and the threat of the West, right, has led us to react to this war, not just invade with several hundred thousand troops. Um, it's kind of backfired on, on that on that front, right? Um, But with respect to Ukraine being a member of the EU or a member of NATO, certainly, Daniela mentioned this earlier, right? There would be a huge European investment, right, um, into Ukraine. But you have to become a member first. And I I think it's very difficult. Uh, it will be very difficult for Ukraine to join as long as Vladimir right. Putin is in power and, and continuing to uh, to stir the, stir the pot, let's say, in, in Ukraine. Okay. Right, uh, Everett. Just to, just to add, and I I think your answer is absolutely perfect. It's not happening while the war is happening. <laughs> right, this is this is a after <laughs> a peace accord. Um, Regardless you know, of what Zelensky is saying, uh, he wants to fast track I mean, the process. Exactly. I mean, it, and 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 that strategy, right? And even NATO and the and the EU signaling very clearly that they are open. Uh, to both, that's that's strong signaling on their side as well to the Russian side, right, and to the Ukrainians, um, because for the Ukrainians it's important not just to keep their territory but to rebuild. Obviously, they want to have a nation, they want to have a country after this, um, and and 
that also fuels their hope <laughs> and encourages right. them, right? That that's possible, but that's that's far into the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so Nancy Kemmel also asks, considering the vast swath of Ukraine that has now been planted with landmines, how viable is the rebuilding and reconstruction? And more importantly, how will this translate to their future agricultural viability? Very interesting question. Absolutely. Everett, do you want to take that or Daniela? So, uh, I mean, yeah. I can get started by by acknowledging lack of understanding of how much agricultural land has actually been, um, uh, you know, been taken um, by, like, I, I don't have a good notion of that, right? Obviously, it's a problem. I, I don't have a, a map in front of me that tells me how much <laughs> agricultural land uh, has been compromised. Right. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's a problem, period. Right. It's a problem of rebuilding. It's a problem of creating a sense of security and uh, allowing people to live their lives in peace and with some semblance of security. So I would imagine that, again, in the best case scenario in which the war is over and there's a plan for rebuilding Ukraine and foreign capital is pouring in again, uh, and there's direct aid from the West uh, to help all of this, to help integrate, right, rebuild and integrate the Ukrainian economy, that would also be an effort, might be led by one of the agencies of the United Nations to decontaminate the land, right? To, to try, but as we know, this is a process that can take multiple years, decades even, um, depending on how much effort we're able to, uh, and, and how much money and resources uh, one is actually able to put towards that. It's a, it's a fascinating angle. I never thought about that question about agricultural production. Yeah. I'm sure someone has answered it, and I apologize that I can't give a fuller answer. <laughs> Everett, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah, I, I say exactly what Daniela mentioned. Um, I don't know what percentage of Ukrainian land has been landmined, right? Um, but two things I'll say um, that are pretty commonsensical. But um, so I grew up on a dairy. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and I can tell you that um, you know, like rocks make it hard. Uh, sometimes to plant, right? When you're ripping or disking and trying to plant corn or trying to plant oats. Um, so landmines would make that really difficult, right? More, more so. Um, and again, not knowing exactly how much land has been landmined or, you know, planted with mines um, and or if it's the agricultural land or if it's more like outside cities, right? For for ground defense, but look to North Korea or look to, I'm sorry, you know, the Korean Peninsula, look to the 30th parallel. Like not only is it one of the most or heavily uh, landmined areas uh, in the world, but uh, nothing will grow there, right? I mean, obviously, you know, like weeds or whatever, right? But like, no one is farming at the 38th parallel, right? That's what prevents the North Koreans from marching into Seoul, and in theory, vice versa, right? Uh, uh, Seoul and, and its US allies marching north. So um, I would imagine, um, I would imagine that there has to be some international agency that would help demine the area, but I, yeah, I really don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to say with any sort of like certainty or expertise, uh, be able to answer that question. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're almost out of time, but I would like both of you to, you know, if, if you want, make some final remarks. Um, we, we, we've we talked extensively about how this war is probably not going to end in 2023. Is that, that would be a nice finishing touch like what can we expect for 2023 but uh as you've both mentioned probably not the end of the war so what are some final remarks you can make like is there anything that Zelensky can do this year uh to 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 improve the situation and uh what would be maybe the best case scenario in 2023 Daniela want to want to take that one first okay <laughs> um Zelensky is doing what he needs to be doing, right? Um, he, uh, I mean, we, we all know <laughs> that he was perhaps the greatest surprise coming out of, um, of this conflict at the beginning of last year. I mean, he has really proven his chops and his determination um, as, as a political and a military leader um, in this fight for the very existence of Ukraine, uh, and he is couching that in, in, in framing it 
not as a fight for Ukraine, but as a fight for the liberal order, right? The liberal international order, as a fight for everything that that liberal international order stands for on, on international law, uh, territorial integrity, sovereignty, self-determination. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible that, um, that he has been able, I mean, he has been a critical piece in being able to pull together this coalition of support for the country. Um, so I expect him to continue to play that role ever so. He has become very savvy <laughs> at uh, projecting and framing the conflict as such. Um, you know, Putin's ultimate goals remain unclear, which makes negotiations very difficult. It's hard to have a starting point for any sort of diplomacy and negotiation if you don't know what the ultimate goal of the enemy is. So there's a lot of guessing. And certainly, you know, we've all heard and read analysts that, you know, think that he wants to stop at Ukraine, that thinks he won't stop at Ukraine, that he might move on to other Eastern European countries and whatnot. But right now, until we actually have more clarity, so until we have some form of dialogue, even if it's behind the scenes, um, that, that clearly indicates a willingness on the Russian side to um, come to an agreement. It might be a, you know, an agreement that saves space for both sides, but if it's under Putin, it will definitely have to be an agreement that saves space for Putin. Otherwise he won't enter it, right? Um, but we need that, right? And and there's no signal right now that we have that in 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 any form, right? Um, Putin definitely needs military victories more than ever. So I think it's safe to guess that he is going to throw everything he has at this conflict in 2023, um, and that's why it's so relevant that Biden made the trip to Ukraine, that the NATO. Uh, meeting, you know, uh, reassured Ukrainians um, and other allies that, you know, their commitment remains unambiguous uh, and that the G7, I believe today, is supposed to announce further aid as well if they haven't done so already. So it's, 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 it's vital, right? It's vital, uh, more even than in the first year, that the West steps up to help Ukraine against what is clearly to be a, a very aggressive offensive by the Russians in the weeks and months to come. Um, what else can I say here? Mm, yeah, I, I'll stop there. If I think of something else to add, I'll come back. Sorry. It's easy to get lost in our own thoughts once we start speaking. <laughs> any, any final remarks from you, Everett? Yeah, I would. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, I want to echo everything that Daniela just mentioned. Um, I didn't really know much about Zelensky, to be perfectly honest, uh, before this conflict. Like, you know, I knew he was the executive. I knew he won an election, et cetera. But like, uh, I think he's done a, this has been a masterclass um, in how to rally the troops, rally your people and rally the international community behind um, uh, self, uh, a self-preservation effort. So I think he's done an excellent job. Um, I think, uh, President Biden's, uh, recent trip and him echoing President Woodrow Wilson's, um, rhetoric surrounding World War I about, uh, couching this conflict as, you know, making the world safe for democracy. This is a war of democracy against authoritarianism. Um, this is a war about, you know, supporting international institutions. One thing that President Biden has done since coming to office, some coming into office has been his uh, unwavering support for NATO. Um, I think these are all what we'd call observable implications of President Biden's uh, commitment to NATO and commitment to international to the international order. Um, Zelensky, uh, I think, is doing a great job again of you know rallying the troops, rallying international support, and also towing the line of um, I think recently, and I can't I, I can't remember if it was Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. I just read this past week. Uh, China potentially playing like peacemaker, right? Being like uh, the one to help negotiate between the two parties. And Zelensky saying, we have to be open to everything. We have to hear them out. So he's wrecking, I mean, obviously he's in bed with the West, right? And of course that's who's supporting him. But I think he recognizes the writing on the wall of 
is Kyiv really going to march their troops all the way to Moscow? No, of course not, right? So what does victory look like for Ukraine? Is it picking Russia out of this 10% of territory right that they've overtaken? Is it retaking Crimea, right? The Crimean Peninsula? Is it negotiating a ceasefire, negotiating a truce, and then gaining entrance into the EU or NATO? I I don't know, right? Um, but what needs to happen, uh, or what it will happen, I suppose, is that this will be a long protracted war. Um, I would imagine that Putin would have let or learned from the past year. Um, we can all remember, like in February, March, the large convoys of like trucks and tanks stuck in the mud. So maybe he waits for some thaw, right? He waits for some winter thaw. And in the spring, as Daniela mentioned, throws everything he has at Ukraine, right? To make them capitulate. Fine, you give up this territory and we'll call it a day, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, that, again, that's one of the major reasons that Zelensky and Ukraine need the continued support of, of the West. Otherwise, that could be a game, set, match, right? Uh, Putin, uh, I think these losses have been, been striking. I think they've been surprising uh, for him, obviously. Um, but I, I would argue Putin is not stupid, um, and can learn from his mistakes. So, uh, yeah, I think the, yeah, I'll leave it there before I, before I get lost in my own thoughts. <laughs> so a mix of, uh, not optimism and not, uh, absolute doom for 2023. Okay. Well, Hello, Rita. I <laughs> oh, no, I just, I just wanted to add one very academic thought. Okay. <laughs> at the end of this, which is maybe not necessarily for 2023, but you know, one way to, or one way to think of a scenario from the point of view of Russia and what's happening here is, is to look at uh, you know, the end of empires, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and to me, this is like the last hurrah of the idea of the Russian empire. And it often doesn't go well for the empire side of things. So um, it's very typical in situations of a superpower declining in power uh, to overreach and to overreact. And that overreaction traditionally and historically has led to uh, the speedy collapse of the regime. So, mm -hmm we might be seeing that play out. It's definitely a viable scenario if we are to take lessons, even from Russia itself, <laughs> and right. the collapse of some of its previous regimes. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, on behalf of the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the US, I want to thank you, Professor Daniela and Professor Everett, for the time that you dedicated to uh, this program today. Thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in live, who, who asked some questions. And uh, I hope to talk to you very soon, um, maybe on a more happy pretense, um, because this this is a somber anniversary. It's one year of war. No one was expecting this. So uh, hopefully something uh, better is, is waiting down the line. Thank you so much for being with us today.